Hello. Hello. Yeah, there one, we three. So one and I are going to sing a song. All right. So for those okay. who are late, we're starting a karaoke session. Okay. You haven't um, heard how bad this could be. This is terrible. I've emptied bars before. I wanted to check. Remember earlier today I was saying if you could sit with folk from your country cluster. Oh, is it now? No, it's not immediately yeah. now, but it will be after immediately that. after this session. So if you're not there now, whilst we're sorting out the PowerPoint, if you want to move around, now will be a really good time. So jump up and move. Sit with your, with your, your folk. Find your people. Sit with your people. So one, two peanuts walking down a road. It's not on. Hello. Hello. I was on a minute ago. I think I just put one. Hello. You think that we would play next? We go up here. It's not it. Hello? Okay, perfect. Charlie, what happened to the one that work at the global level? Where do they sit? Right, there's a, there's a global table out in the front um, in case you're country less. Um, you're more than welcome to also come and join some of our colleagues. You know, why don't you take over this table? For... All right. Is this kind of like Jerry meandering? I mean, is this what they call them? Um... You have the Nigeria table here. I see clearly this is Syria, Gaza, and Terp, cross border. We have global colleagues. Is there anyone else from Latin America? <laughs> All right, over there. Yes, friends. Uh, we have colleagues working at the global um, level in the front, in the corner here. All right. Let's settle down. Um, I would like to get us moving on this morning's um, discussion. So I hope that you enjoy the, the morning sessions and the breakout sessions. And one of the reasons that we plan it this way was, um, was just noticing also how much information we collect. And also like, you know, maybe sometime how little of it we actually use. Um, and the different people that camp managers actually have to engage with in order to like share information, receive information, do analysis process, please settle down. Thank you. Yeah, we can take pictures another time. So we wanna make sure that all of you also talk and discuss and reflect on things around like the data that you're collecting talk a lot about like information is power and what does it create when you are the one holding the information so have you ever been in any assessment where you would feel uncomfortable providing the information that were being asked of people being assessed shows of hand please like danny what kind of information would you have been uncomfortable providing sexual orientation even in our staff survey i don't put my um, gender or sexual preference um anyone else was there any information that you would feel uncomfortable providing while you're collecting them robert income. right income and livelihood how much money do you earn yes come out shout it out Sharing uh, location of IDPs, uh, so that also considered, you know, some. Wow. <laughs> it's the you collect, but you would be uncomfortable sharing. Okay. Bank account. 
but address address yeah address. yeah um would you say no sorry it depends depends on what who's asking what is it for but would you feel comfortable saying no like no sorry like do you just say agree on those kind of you know do you agree with these things and data we're going to collect when you sign up on facebook right sometimes it's not an option if i say yeah right but it's if you don't give me the information i i can't give you food you know then then what's your choice then who has the power And sometimes it's not clear how it's going to be used afterwards, not just the person, but how that the, how that data is going to be used in the future or how it's going to be stored or transferred in the future. Absolutely. I mean, yeah, like we say, oh, by doing this, you're consenting to X, Y and Z. Right. So today um, we have two colleagues. Um, we have Rob, who co-chairs um, a working group on data responsibilities um, together. So it's a working group that was tasked by ISC um, and it's co-chaired by OCHA, IOM, UNHCR and DRC to develop the guidance on data responsibilities. And we also have Agnes, who's our um, protection expert and who's currently the GBV rapid response officer um, with our global CCCM team. So over to you. Thank you so much, Juan. Everybody all right, good. So we want to go into you one ask very crucial questions, and I want us to think about some of those questions. In our, we've been asked, well, do you be able to share some of this information? What information would you be wanting to share? Would you say yes? Would you say no? Right? And there was an answer here that said it depends, or sometimes it's not an option, so I have to share it anyway. Why is privacy a big thing? Why is privacy important? Why is privacy an issue? Why do you? He said, because it can be used against us. And also the online, the team online, you can type on the chat and we can pick up your think, response. So it can be used against us, yes? I think the answer is in the question. The answer is- Because it's private. <laughs> because it's private. <laughs> All right. Yes. Dignity. Dignity, right. So privacy is a big portion around my one, your right. We have a right to privacy. That is something that, and the right to privacy means that I have a decision around which information about myself I should be able to share, to whom I want to share that information, and how should that information be shared, right? And, uh, the OHCHR, keep confusing that name, <laughs> has a special rapporteur actually for a special rapporteur for privacy. How many knew that? There's a special rapporteur for privacy. <laughs> One, two, three. <laughs> yeah, this is how important the issue of privacy is. We actually have somebody who's dedicated at a global level, supposed to be looking at what is it that we're doing around privacy? How are we addressing it? What can we do? Yeah, and the issue around privacy, it's not just about what information I want to share, because it also goes into your freedoms, your freedom to express your identity, your sexual orientation, your religious beliefs, your political associations, right? The issue of privacy then becomes a very big thing when we ask information around what ethnic group are you in or where your home of origin is. There's a reflection in some of those cases that if you're from this area where I come from, in the country where I come from, if you put area of origin this, everybody knows area of origin is that ethnic group. So there are certain connotations around what does that mean and the associations that come with that as well, right? And then we do not want to associate with that or it affects how we associate and the perceptions that people have of us. And that is something that we always need to be cognizant of. So, when we violate privacy, or let me change it up. When there has been an issue of viol a violation of privacy, in certain cases, one, what are the examples that you have of cases where there have been violations of privacy? 
what happened in a case? You don't, I don't want to go into detail. Just tell me the outcome. There was a security risk or there was stigma or there was shame or I felt angry if it was yourself. A group of people. D depends on their beliefs or their uh, private data. So there was violence against the group of people because of a breach of privacy. What else? Anyone example? Any other example? Protecting the privacy now. Not yourself. <laughs> don't, and I say, don't share your cases. <laughs> don't tell me this case happened like this. Just tell me what was the end result. At the end result, I think uh, somehow stigmatization. Yes. Yes, don't go into details, <laughs> just end result. <laughs> uh, no, some people have been like, uh, I mean, publicly shamed on social media, et cetera, for like some personal characteristics. Right. So there has also been public shame on social media and a lot of us on social media, right? Instagram, Twitter, WhatsApp. I don't even know what the others are. <laughs> All right, there are some examples from Mohamed Kordi online says, sometimes it's just annoying like sharing the phone numbers to person that I don't want to share with. Very true. Sometimes as a lady, people ask, can you share your number? <laughs> like 07777 <laughs> yeah. In some cases, I used to give my brother's number so that you, <laughs> you, you call and get there and get my brother. All right, trying to make light, yes. But indeed, phone numbers can be very sensitive. Sharing of phone numbers can mean sometimes that you can get tracked with, through those phone numbers. And this is an issue that we need to be thinking about. How do we look at this? And a lot of times, most of our work, we tell people we get consent, true? Right? Most of us, how many in their forms have that dot? that square you can tick a box or round where you can tick a box. I have consent. <laughs> you agreeing? Yes. We all have these forms where we say, I'm collecting this information and I'm consenting to you sharing this information. But one thing that was asked before, also going back to the questions that I, I, one asked is, did you say no to those questions? Right. And uh, when I contacted them, they were wanting me to consent that this data I'm putting there, they will use it. So I contact them, I don't want you to use it because it's uh, yeah, in private data, we cannot just anyone use it. And I said no, and they reply with me, it's as you wish. You don't have to use that program or that tool. And we are all using that company <laughs> tools. <laughs> yeah. So. In our cases, a lot of times we have apps on our phones or pop-ups on our computers that come up and say, accept all, reject all, accept with conditions, which ones, yeah? Only the necessary ones. We all have this and we keep changing them. But let's go back to us thinking about the work that we do and the practitioners that we are in the communities that we are and the information we get as practitioners. When you're a CCCM practitioner and getting information in those cases. What happens is that there's a sort of a power dynamic in the communities that we have. We hold the aid, right? And uh, a lot of times beneficiaries, when we ask this information, they, we are asking information so that we can be able to share with you assistance, right? So when we come back and we are not sharing, <laughs> we, we can't share, the issue then becomes, okay, they consented because they want assistance. But is that really consent? Yeah, that's something that we need to be thinking about. I don't want us to go <laughs> into enough of that. We don't have enough time to <laughs> delve in whether that is really consent or not. But there's also the aspect of it. Okay, I shared my information so that I can get a shelter or I can get mobile cash. But did I share that information so that that information can be analyzed and used for something else? Yeah. Because there's also the aspect of it that we sh people share the consent, but we always assume some, or we sometimes assume that we have a blanket consent, right? If I gave you consent to register me, then it means I've given you consent to report 
that I am being assisted. I've given you consent to share my information with other people. I've given you consent to do ABCD. But for us to really look at whether there is actual consent, there has to be, does the person understand really what you're going to do with that information? Has that really been explained to them? Is this something that they know that I am signing here and this information is going to go here, is going to go there? So a lot of us, we've worked in the field and will come, the donor will come and tell you, I want to speak to about oh, one, two, three people of your beneficiaries. Yeah, sometimes they want to, but, but you then have to go look through your register again and say, ah, I know Agnes is here, right? <laughs> is that something that they wanted? We do a lot of uh, case studies and good practices, or oh, what do we call them? What is the other name that we have where we tell lessons learned and the individual stories? I'm forgetting the individual. Oh, yes, there is a, the impact stories. We moved, <laughs> we moved from success, now we call them impact stories, right? So the impact story where we are talking about Agnes and how Agnes's life was transformed because ABCD assistance. Do we get consent for those cases? Do we get consent to share that information in different platforms? Is that something that we consider? Because these are things that we need necessarily need to consider and make sure that we are thinking about. And there are a lot of examples around, I won't go back to the examples because we've had, when you share information, we, and some of it, we do it in good faith. We want to do referrals. I have an example where some community, they are looking for, women GBV survivors so that they can give them cash. That sounds like a good idea, no? They are going to get cash, but no, <laughs> it's not a good idea. So again, as the industry standards, we say that's not a good thing. It's going to lead a lot of times to identification, stigma, right? That is going to happen to the survivor because of this issue. So those are the things that, or sometimes we have HIV, and we want to do referrals. There is antivirals that need to be given. We have just come in and as a company. So we want to do this information and we go down our register and we say here X names that we can give you and they can be right for antivirals because they indicated in their forms that they signed before they are not getting any treatment for HIV. So let's give them, yeah? Those are violations. Some, in some cases, what happens is that you have the way, violence ensuing because maybe family members didn't know that this was a case that was HIV positive, right? So there are instances where there's challenges around, what do we do? Is this consent actual consent? And what did they consent to? Is something that we constantly have to engage with and think about as we do our work. I want to move now so that we go to look at what are the guidelines that are there around data and the use of data, and I'll have Robert do that. Thanks. Hello. Yeah, hi, everyone. So as one mentioned, I'm part of a team um, that has been working on data responsibility along with UNHCR, OCHA, and DRC. And um, last year, we, uh, under a task force of the ISCC, we were working on guidelines for data responsibility to tackle some and more and more so the topics that Agnes and Juan were talking about. So in, we've seen out in the, in the floor that we have so much information, the way we collect it, the way we store it, the way we share it, the way we disseminate it, uh, we all do in different ways. So this was kind of, th this is great. Our programmers be benefit immensely from this, but also we're becoming more aware that we need to be more respons responsible with how we kind of work with data, how we manage it. So we published these guidelines uh, at the end of last year, at the beginning of last year, sorry, to about data responsibility and all aspects of data responsibility. This is not data protection. This is not um, how to store individual personal information, but this is holistically, how do we work with data? How do we do needs assessments? How do we use it for advocacy? How may we use personal information? How do we do analysis and so on? So we've kind of defined it as the safe, ethical and effective management of data. So all aspects of the data life cycle from collection to storage, to sharing, to analysis, to dissemination uh, and to destruction as well. So we, uh, we identified 
um, eight areas of actions of how we can be responsible. And th these are all super small on the screen and I'll, I'll share the guidelines, but it's basically if anyone's working with data, these are kind of some of the key areas that we can work on, that we can be in, involved in and to improve kind of how we work. And the issue is, is that often, oh, this is a data discussion. I'm going to let the IMO, IMO figure this out. But a lot of the stuff that Agnes was just mentioned, that's nothing to do with the role of an IMO. It's to do with the program team. It's to do with the manager. So some of the actions say is designing for responsibility. Like, do we need to collect those particular protection cases if we're not, if we're not going to respond to them? So, that, so basically just how do we be responsible in the designing phase? Um, ecosystem mapping. So what I mean by that is if what data exists out there in the kind of the CCM environment for you guys and what doesn't, there's no point going out and collecting information if it already exists. So work with partners, understand what's out there and understand the gaps. And if there's gaps, then go out and collect it, sure. But understanding what out there is kind of the first step of being responsible. The first rule is, is if, you, if something already exists, you don't need to go and collect it. You don't need to, A, spend the budget to go and collect data. You don't need to take the time to train the enumerators. You don't need to ask the affected populations these particular questions that as we identified through one, that some may or may not be sensitive and so on, so on, so on. And then there's um, the sharing aspect. So sometimes our agencies work quite insular of each other. So obviously through coordination and through the cluster, sharing data is a key aspect to kind of reduce some more these ones. Obviously there's a risk with that. Um, some agencies have very large kind of legal units that can support data sharing, others may not. Um, and also data incident management. Um, so what I mean by this is when something does go wrong, share it because that's how we learn there's too many cases now kind of in the in the, in the sector where perhaps there may be a hack or there may be a way that personal data has been shared irresponsibly and it's kind of brushed under the rug a little bit but the only way we can we can learn from these from these kind of mistakes and to improve is is really documentation what happened maybe where something went wrong and kind of um basically doing the lessons learned from that so kind of more safeguards get, imp get improved moving forward. And then, um, yeah, sorry. And then, so what we did here, so this has all been done. So I'm gonna share the guidance, but basically this is just an example. So what uh, the guidance is done is, is stratified across three areas. So we looked at how data works within a sector response. So say the HCT, ICCG level, um, through the clusters and through organizational level. So basically, Though the, the set of actions there, we've essentially kind of translated to the recommended approach. So this is quite general. And I should say that during the development of the data responsibility guidelines that took about 12 months, we did consultations with all of the clusters. Brian and Juan were involved from the IOM CCM side, for example, just to really understand that for those particular actions that would be consistent, whether you're at HCT level, whether you're at a particular cluster, CCM, shelter, whatever, or organizational level, but then the approach would vary would vary immensely. So um, yeah, how you do designing for responsibility, say as IOM for a particular cash program, that would be very different than if you're working cluster and you have to involve other actors and so on, so on, so on. And then uh, these terms can be quite conceptual. They can be quite difficult um, to kind of get your head around. So we've also then done roles and responsibility. So in the cluster, who is responsible for the effective use of data? Um, I don't know, Juan, I'm going to ask you that because you're... But it's a tough question, right? Like no one really knows. So like, this is why this kind of eco ecosystem mapping, who's in charge, who's got it, who's sharing is so important, kind of really trying to kind of like get a few of the crooks out of the, of the problem. And then, and then what we've also done as well with the blue, and we've done this for all of the actions, is then we've kind of provided tools and templates. So if you're not familiar with a particular concept or if your organization doesn't have a data sharing agreement, or if you want to kind of understand the concepts of designing for responsibility, or if you want to understand maybe how to do some of the ecosystem mapping of what data is out there, what isn't, what's the gaps, then all of the tools um, are available and they're all, they've all been designed specifically for cluster use. They haven't yet been adapted to CCCM. I think that's the next, the next uh, discussion, but this is just a kind of a Kickstarter. So if you are programmatically or in coordination regarding CCM 
and you and you are starting to think more about okay we, we've got lots and lots of data how do we store it how do we share it how do we analyze it how do we disseminate it how do we get rid of it the starting points has kind of all been put in place for you and so you can go and then obviously the sensitivity of data in ukraine may be very differently they're very different to what it is in iraq and so on so then you can so the baseline information is there and, and you can kind of contextually adapt it to the context we just had a session just a, a moment ago and we had some syria colleagues and we have some south sudan colleagues and some iraq colleagues and a different type of information they were saying sensitive was very different based on the context they were from it was it was interesting to see so these tools are quite malleable to the context but it's a kickstarter so if you want to try and kind of understand some of these kind of key areas of data responsibility then then the tools are here and then this year the isac is has tasked the same team to do a revision of the guidance um a revision of the guidance to kind of ground truth it more so if you do want to get in engaged in these these type of discussions um myself and my colleague who emails are there um get in touch and if you have any questions if you're a cluster if you're coordination or if you program and you're like okay we're kind of being aware we've got lots and lots of data we don't know how quite how to handle it or are we working with it appropriately you know are we maybe presenting too sensitive information or too detailed or whatnot or you know we've got lots of information another agency can benefit from why should they go out and collect it and double duplicate confuse things if we've got it how do we share it with them all the tools are there and myself and my colleague Stuart can uh, can respond to any of your needs, share you the guidance, and hopefully walk you through uh, some of the tools that may help the CCM program. And that is me done. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you so much. And we're, it's back to you, Charlie. But you don't have a sound. You don't have a voice. I do now. 